this. One, of course, just to celebrate what God is doing, to realize, you know, uh, we're a majority with God. The church is victorious, right? We have the answer for a lost and hurting world. Uh, but you would also today just say, you know what, Lord? I, I want all of what you have for me. I want all of what you have for me. You don't have to covet anyone else's ministry. Uh, you know, it'd be like the same as coveting a shoe that's three sizes too small for you. You wouldn't even, even if you had it, you wouldn't like it. You think you would, but you wouldn't. You want what he, the perfect one, made for you. Amen? Amen. So let's pray. We're going to get in 1 Corinthians 13, and then we're going to go to Revelation 3. Um, and let's go right now. Lord God, we just thank you so much for all of what you're doing this is the Lord's doing, the psalmist says, and it is marvelous in our sight. Lord, it is marvelous. Lord, we pray for those even right now, from our young people at Level Up, with thinning hair because they don't eat, to those who are eating alive with bed bugs and can't even focus in school because they're wondering if they're going to be homeless, those sleeping on half-deflated air mattresses. Lord, those that just are going through so much, and we thank you that we can be a place for the children. Mm -hmm. Lord, as they come in and 60 plus percent, perhaps, Muslim, to get to feel and see the love of Jesus. And Lord, we pray for every one of them. And it's just so great to know that as you love us, so you love them. And so it's so amazing to be loved by you. And you told us freely we've received this love, now freely give it. We repent of, of not freely giving love, of not endeavoring to give it the way we receive it from you. Would you get us excited again about being able to freely give this unconditional love that you have freely given to us? And Lord, it all begins in your word. So now as we get in your word, may your word get into us. Thank you, Lord Jesus, for the gospel, the good news, for dying on the cross, for the likes of us, the diabolical likes of us, to make us sons of God and daughters of God. We pray for everything discussed today. Holy Spirit, would you just fall upon all of what we've spoken about, all of what we're endeavoring in line with your will. We need you. Speak to us from your word. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So <clears throat> as you guys know, we're working our way through the book of John. We're going through John chapter by chapter and verse by verse. We're in John 13, but we've been arrested by the story of Jesus washing the disciples' feet, plain and simple. It's not a matter of, oh, wow, is this week five on this thing with the disciples' feet? I think what we need to be doing is saying, wow, why in my Christian life have I not spent five weeks looking at Jesus washing the disciples' feet? So literally, it shouldn't be, whoa, again, it should be, wow, the more we do this, the more I realize I've gone years, maybe decades, treating this story like it is just the credits to the movie or like the beginning credits to the movie. You know, the crucifixion is where it all happens. You know, this here is just the beginning credits. Oh, yeah, the Last Supper. Yeah, 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 I know it. Uh, but it's Jesus that says, do you understand what I have done? He asked the disciples after he washes all of their feet and washes Judas's feet as well. He asked the question, do you understand what I've done? You see, he wouldn't be asking the question, do you understand, unless it'd be so easy for the likes of us to not understand and get it twisted. You understand what I'm saying? Do you understand? So yes, this is week five as we're seeking to study this so that we can say to the Lord, yes, Lord, I do understand. I want to ask you, do you understand? Do you, through sitting through this over the weeks, do you understand what Jesus is showing us? Do you understand how we need to literally hear the words afresh of what he says? If you do this, people will know that you are my followers. People will know you're my followers by the love you have for one another. And interestingly, Jesus gets up from the table and washes the disciples' feet. Luke 22 tells us it's right on the heels of them arguing at the table over who's the greatest. 
So here they are at the table, which we know as the Last Supper, the evening before the crucifixion. And as they're sitting at the table and Jesus is showing them what other centeredness looks like, right? If anyone had the right to be distracted or in their own thoughts, it would be Jesus on the eve before he knows what those Roman assassins are going to do to him and that he'll be crucified. If anyone had the right to be inward, to be, oh, guys, I'm sorry, I'm just not really, I'm, my thoughts are elsewhere. Oh, Jesus, say less. You've already told us that you're about to be betrayed and crucified. If anyone had the right to be inward and into themselves, it would have been Jesus at that moment. And what does he do? He he shows himself as the most other centered in that moment in getting up from the supper table right on the heels of them all debating over who's the greatest among them and he shows them what greatness is he lays aside his garments wraps a towel around himself and does the task of what was the most menial task for anyone to do it was really for the butler the maid of the house right and he being at the head of the table, if you will, shows them what greatness is. He washes all of their feet, dries it with the towel, and in a sandal-wearing culture, in the dirt and the sand all day, when he is done, all of their dirt is on that towel, a.k.a. all of that dirt is on him, a.k.a. a picture of him taking all of our dirt to the cross, right? So again, Jesus, when he's done, says in John 13, do you understand what I have done? And by this shall all men know that you're my disciples if you have this kind of love for one another. He even says in John 13, verse 17, if you know these things, Happy are you if you do them. It's another beatitude, beatus. Basically, the Latin word is a happiness that the pagans of the day, the Greeks and the Romans said only the gods above could experience this kind of happiness. But what is the reality? God Almighty comes down in the face of Jesus Christ and tells us how we can have that kind of happiness. So in a world that's ever on a pursuit for happiness, in a world that says there is no happiness that could truly be found here, only the quote-unquote gods can have it, the reality is God came down and told us how we can have a happy life. It is walking with Jesus, but we know it has to be more than just quote-unquote walking with Jesus, because I know a lot of believers who are born again, and they're miserable people. I know a lot of believers who are born again and hanging with them sometimes is like eating a wet sandwich at a picnic. Let's keep it a bean. You heard, oh, no, 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 only me? You, oh, what about you? I, I, I'm sure I've been a wet sandwich. You don't think you've ever been a wet sandwich? You say, Lord, is it I? Lord, Lord, is it I? Have I been a wet sandwich at someone's picnic? Meanwhile, you think you're like a cheesesteak with, with chopped onions and you're really just a wet sandwich. You know what I mean? But he tells us that it's walking with Jesus, but it is actively seeking to imitate our Lord. Are you still excited about waking up every day and seizing it as an opportunity to imitate Jesus? Do you remember how when you first got saved, if you had a moment where you even felt that you were remotely imitating him, you were excited. Like, yo, I just gave a dollar to a stranger. Yo, I got an opportunity to imitate Jesus. But all of a sudden now you become mature and spiritually educated. Now you got the gift of discernment. Well, what you going to do with this dollar? And the Lord told me you know, that this dollar is nothing. And, and, you know, and you preach the person's ear off. And you know what I mean? The person hasn't had anything to eat in four days. You keep your dollar. Well, I don't do this. I don't do that. Let's get back to being excited about imitating Jesus because he says in John 13, verse 17, if you know these things, happy are you if you do them. If you're sitting here and you're like, you know what? I am an Eeyore Christian. I am a wet sandwich, right? I'm a Debbie Downer. I know I'm going to heaven though, but I'm not enjoying myself. And I think if I asked my closest people around me, they would say, I look like I don't enjoy myself. But guess what? Would you say, look at your neighbor and say, hope. Hope. There's hope for wet sandwiches like me, hope for wet sandwiches like you, right? We always think someone else is the wet sandwich and not you, right? Or like you're immune from being a wet sandwich. I've said that word a lot today, wet sandwich. Anyway, right? Hope. That's what makes coming to church so amazing. We come to the house of the Lord, we meet the Lord of the house, and we get our mind right. You know what I mean? Like literally, it's like, yo, I know what I need. I need to go get my mind right. How many of you said, I'm glad when they said to me, let's go to the house of the Lord? Like, I'm glad when it was time to go get my mind right, right? It's more than just going to get some theology. I'm going to get my mind right. 
If you know these things, happier if you do them. So that then catapulted us to 1 Corinthians 13. And as we shared last week, we have all, we're all guilty. We're all guilty of making 1 Corinthians 13 into an anthem, a Christian anthem, as opposed to what it's supposed to be. It's supposed to be the word of the living God, sharper than any two-edged sword, that goes down and is even a discerner of your motives and your heart, right? Right? And just like we can sing, you know, fly, eagles, fly, and E-A-G-L-E-S, eagles. I, see, I stumbled on that. I'm not really from Philly. Anyway, my, no, salute, salute. I don't want to start anything. Um, but you get my point. Literally, just as we can fly, eagles, fly, and E-A-G-L-E-S, eagles, 1 Corinthians 13 can just have this place of love is patient, love is kind, and literally it's just the Christian anthem. And when you see it, you don't even get convicted anymore. It's like, oh yeah, love is patient. Oh yeah, I know that. Oh man, that would look nice on a t-shirt, or that would look nice in that frame, or that would look nice embroidered, or maybe I'll get that tattooed. We do everything with it except for doing what it's designed to do. It's designed to check us, to encourage us, first to show us the way Jesus loves us, Secondly, it is there to remind us and to be a mirror for us to see how am I really being salt and light? Am I really reflecting the God of love whom I worship to my brother, to my sister, to my enemies? 1 Corinthians 13. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels, if I have not love, and this is agape, self-sacrificing love, I'm become like a sounding brass or a tinkling cymbal. And though I have the gift of prophecy, even if I understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and even though I have faith so that I can even remove mountains, meaning I can have faith to do the impossible. I can pray and people are healed of hepatitis C. I can pray people are healed of stage four cancer. I can pray people are healed of HIV. I can have faith to move mountains, but if I don't have love, It says, it doesn't say that it profits me nothing. It says that I am nothing. And though, verse 3, I bestow all my goods to feed the poor, even if I give my body to be burned, if I have not love, it profits me nothing. And then here's a description of love. And the first thing we need to do is this, because everything begins in this walk with a fresh vision of Jesus. No matter how foul you are, how funky you are, distant from God, needing a spiritual revival and renewal, everything always begins. You want to get excited about Bible reading again. You want to get back into prayer. You want to literally be able to just say no to this temptation and this easily besetting sin. Everything always comes back to a fresh vision of Jesus. Don't you ever notice that? Whenever you're rocked by Jesus afresh, you're you're, you're not rocked by everything else. Don't you notice that? It's like the seesaw thing. But if I'm not rocked by Jesus, before I know it, I'm rocked by everything else except for Jesus. It's just like the seesaw. Just like this end of the seesaw. If it's up, the other one, you don't even have to see the other half of the seesaw. If you see this side is up, you know for a fact the other side is down and vice versa. So it is with being rocked by the Lord. If I'm rocked by Jesus with a fresh vision of Jesus by his spirit, then I am not being rocked by anything else. But if I am not being rocked by Jesus and I'm just playing church and walking through the motions, then you better believe that in in the secret places of my heart, I am rocked by everything else. So let's come back. And as we come back to Jesus, because the Bible says God is love, 1 John 4, 8, yes? So rock with me, y'all. Let's put Jesus' name in every place you see love And you're going to see who the Lord is for us. Jesus suffers long and is kind. How many of you ever just feel like you're wearing out your welcome with Jesus? You feel like, oh yeah, the kingdom of God is made up of a lot of knuckleheads, but you are the knucklehead. You are the one that is wearing out your welcome. You're treading, you're the one treading on thin ice. You you feel like you're treading on thin ice. No, we replace what we think with truth. Jesus suffers long and is kind. Lamentations 3.23 even says, his mercies are new every morning. You wake up to a fresh supply of steadfast love every morning. Now, growing up, maybe you didn't get that, anything close to that 
from those that even were your parents or those who are supposed to give it. But it says, let your mind be renewed. Jesus suffers long in his kind. Jesus envieth not. Wow. Jesus celebrates everything and wants only the best things for you. Jesus vaunts not itself. Jesus is not puffed up. It is an omnipotent love, but it is a gentle love. It says in James chapter 1, verse 5, you know, it, he upbraideth not. He doesn't throw in your face how he loves you. He doesn't throw in your face how good he is to you. Isn't that amazing? And you never have to hold your breath wondering that, right? You ever hear somebody eventually throw something in someone's face and the other person's like, you know what? I've been wondering when you were going to throw that in my face. I've been waiting. Yo, it'll never happen with Jesus. It'll never happen with Jesus. Jesus, verse 5, does not behave itself unseemly. It means that the Lord just, he's consistent. Consistent and just with good manners. Nothing weird with his love for us. Jesus seeks not his own. And it even says in Romans 15, verse 4, when Jesus came down, he pleased not himself, but he seeks our own. And we even see that in John 13. The night before he will be crucified, he's not seeking his own. He's seeking everyone in the room and to even show them his love. Jesus is not easily provoked. Wow. Jesus is not easily provoked. Jesus thinketh no evil. It means really keeps no records of wrongs. And he does say, I will remember your sins no more. He keeps no record of wrongs. Rejoices not in iniquity, but rejoices in the truth. Verse 7, Jesus bears all things. He'll never leave you or forsake you. Knew all your baggage, all your issues, all the baggage you didn't even think was baggage. Jesus bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures. Would you underline this? Endures all things. Jesus, verse 8, never fails. But whether there be prophecies, they will fail. Whether there be tongues, they will cease. Whether there be knowledge, it will vanish away. And then basically, it says, and as we reflect on this now, with now holding ourselves up against it, verse 4, do you suffer long and are kind at the end? How, how long do you suffer with people? Do you have, it says, what it means is love has a long fuse. Do you have a long fuse with people? Or do you have a short fuse? Verse 4, love has a long fuse and is kind afterwards. Love, envy is not. Do you wrestle with envy? That's not love. Love vaunts not itself, is not puffed up does not behave itself unseemly. It means love has good manners. Do you have good manners? Do you not seek your own? Are you, verse 5, easily provoked? Do you keep record of wrongs? Do you keep record of wrongs? Can I just say something with you today? If you're keeping record of wrongs, let them go. Let it go. Because what bitterness is, is you're drinking poison and you're waiting for the other person to die. That's what bitterness is, drinking poison and waiting for the person that you have an ought against to die. Meanwhile, the person's getting blessed and running around, making up new dances, you know, and you're over there just dying on the inside. Would you let it go for the glory of God and that you could actually begin to grow and not be stuck on stupid? Oh, pastor, you call people stupid. No, I said you're stuck on stupid. I ain't calling anybody stupid. <laughs> Would you let it go? But you know, when the more you get rocked by the fact that Jesus has forgiven you, you'll find it so much easier to forgive. Fall in love with the fact that you're forgiven. Fall in love with the fact that that beam in your eye has been covered in the blood of Jesus and you will, it, 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 love covers the multitude of sins. You'll be excited about when you can forgive others. Not just a matter of, yeah, well, church taught me I got to be forgiven. You will be excited at the opportunity to forgive. You know what? I forgive and I'm excited I'm getting to do for someone else what Jesus does for me, right? Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. What the world needs today is a love that never fails. What the world needs to see. I mean, look, come on, y'all. How many people do you know who are just throwing in the towel? 
You have some that are just walking away from the faith. The Bible actually predicts that that would happen in the last days, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. You have those that are still present, but they've just kind of checked out. Hand is off the plow. They're just kind of walking while others push the plow, kind of in step. But their hands are no longer on the plow. What this world needs is only what we have the answer. They need a love that never fails. They need to see. We need to be the hands and the feet of Jesus. A love that costs us something. A love that when you swear, you swear to your own hurt. This is what the world needs to see today. And Jesus said, by this will all men know that you're my followers. Right? So, verse 11. And please, let's zero in here, because this is kind of where we went off last week and then put a comma on it. Paul says this, when I was a child, follow me, y'all, y'all with me? Elbow your neighbor and say, chill, we're just getting started. When I was a child, verse 11, I spoke as a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. For now we see through a glass darkly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, but then I will know even as I am also known. And now abides faith, hope, and love, these three. But the greatest of these is love. But again, verse 11, when I was a child, I spoke as a child. I understood as a child and I thought as a child. But when I became a man, I put away childish things. Underline childish. Underline childish. It's interesting, right? Because we see the image of a child in Scripture. And come on, y'all, if we're on the treadmill now, we're now going to take it from like, you know, a 5.1 to a nice 6.5 jog now. You feel me? All right? But it's interesting that as we see a child introduced in the Scriptures, we see it, a child introduced in a positive light and in a not positive light. You follow me? Jesus said, unless you become as a child, you cannot inherit the kingdom of God. So there is an element, right, of, of what a child exemplifies that Jesus wants us to imitate, right? You can look at a, a child, just the humility of a child, right? You can look at just the, the innocence of a child, right? Um, just, you know, just the loyalty of a child, you know? Um, Jesus said, unless you become as a child, you will not inherit the kingdom of God. But then here we see it in a not positive light where Paul says uh, there's a certain way that a child thinks and understands um, that's childish. So we need to make sure that we see Jesus upholding the positive qualities of a child and that we as mature adults don't ever uh, think we're to move away from, right? The way a child can just be in awe and wonder at one thing, right? Right? Just focus on that one thing, that one toy. We could just focus just on Jesus. I mean, there's so many positive elements that Jesus is causing us, wanting us to study in a child. But then Paul's coming here in verse 11 and saying, yeah, there's some not positive stuff about a child. So why don't we do this? Let's divide it between the beautiful attributes of a child and being childish. Because he says here, when I became a man, I put away childish things. So Paul's not coming along and saying, hey, Jesus said there's positive elements about a child. I'm saying that there's nothing. He's saying, no, no, no. I'm talking about being childish. Jesus wants us to be as children. Paul's saying, but don't be childish. Do you get it now? So there literally is some splicing we need to do, right? Do you appreciate that? Because if you, we use scripture to interpret scripture, no? Yes? Okay. So... The question is, am I childish? And, you know, that really be like fighting words, right? Nobody wants to be called childish. Nobody in the church wants to be called a spiritual babe. Everybody's mature, right? And nobody wants to be called childish. But we have to ask ourselves, well, it's not me, then who? Right? The question is, Lord, show me if there be any wicked way in me. Search my heart. 
What Paul is saying to this church, and remember, this is a context of a church that was competing with one another for spiritual gifts. This was a church where those who had food would eat and not give food when they would have love feasts at their small group, if you will. Those that had food would bring it, and they wouldn't give food to those that didn't have it. They were arguing with one another. They were taking each other to court. You know, this, this church was caught up in a lot of stuff. And you know, tradition says that the church, this church at Corinth, probably had around 30 to 35 people. I mean, you would read it, and because Paul's expounding so much and writes them all these letters, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, oh, it must have been a megachurch. I mean, well, there were no megachurches back then, you know? But all of this going on, tradition says about 25 to 35 people. And Paul is telling them, it's time to get back to love. Let no man think he stand, lest he fall. And it's time to decide what parts of my life are just plain childish. I mean, that, what a word, right? I mean, you just talk about like, I mean, just the word alone is like a spanking. You know what I mean? Just, just I mean, it's a sobering word, childish. Not, you know, because we like to call it other things. Well, what areas do I need to grow in, right? What areas, what are my spiritual blind spots? I mean, isn't it, we can romanticize, right, our immaturity, right? We can hyper-spiritualize our immaturity by, by padding it with language. The Bible comes right in and says, What's childish? And it's time to put away childish things. If you call yourself a man, if you call yourself mature in the faith, it's time to go to war with the things that are childish. So we're going to ask this question. What's childish in my life? Am I childish? And I have a few things that I want to bring up that people do when they're childish, that, that, that kids do. No, to my kids, I'm not going to be using y'all as examples. You know, when your pastor's kids, it's like, oh, man, he's about to bring up, you know, he loves stories. Okay, which story is going to be us? Then the siblings start, you know, laughing. Okay, he's probably going to bring up that one on you anyway. I'll bring up my own stories when I was little. So here's some things about children when they're being childish, right? One, when it comes to socializing, they have a, a recess yard mentality, what it means is you run to the same people, you love on the same friend group, and you have no notice for who's not playing kickball, no notice for who's been hurt, no notice for who's sitting at the bench. It is just the same thing. When that recess door opens, everyone runs. It's already premeditated who you're going to be with the whole time, and you stay in this routine. That's childish, right? When we see our Lord Jesus literally see, searching out whom to see, even saying to people, you know, the Zacchaeus in the tree, I must have dinner with you tonight. That is the exact opposite of a recess yard mentality, right? And not only does Jesus go to a man in a tree named Zacchaeus, the man was a robber, a thief, a liar. I must, that is way out. See, that's Jesus. So if you have a recess yard mentality at church, same friend group, same conversation. You know what I mean? Moving, actually working the room to just see who needs a hug. And you're literally finding your happiness and literally just loving on as many people as you could see. If you have a recess yard mentality, you're childish. If you only go to church when pressured or because so-and-so might say such and such, that's childish. Think of as parents when it's like with our kids. Hey, we shouldn't have to make you go to church. You should go even if we don't, right? If you only go when pressured, that's childish. If, let's talk about this. No practical regard for others. How many of y'all adults have ever gone to the fridge and your kid, right, has drunk all the juice, but literally left just enough to just make you covet more. Just enough, just like a cartoon drop for the tongue and put the car and right back inside. No practical regard for others. If we walk in such a way where we're coming to the house of the Lord and it's all about just what we can get out of it and you're just putting the carton back, that's childish, Right? What about running away in the face of conflict? You discipline a kid, challenge a kid. I'm running away. <laughs> I'm packing my bag. 
How are you when you don't get along with someone in the church? How are you when you've been offended in the church? Are you packing your bag and running away? That's childish. And that is the opposite of Jesus' love, who hopes all things, believes all things, and endures all things, right? What about when kids need to be doing the dishes? And yet they, okay, they wash dishes Thanksgiving, but man, they talk, dishes grow every day, but they literally have made this once in a blue act of dishes into this memorial, <laughs> right? It's like, yo, I, but that time I scrubbed everything and I scrubbed and it's like, well, one, someone does that every day because you're always having clean dishes, right? But they take this one instance and it's now a lifetime memorial. How do you serve in the church? If you come out and serve in the church, oh, that one outreach, that time I served and got a boo-boo and a paper cut right here, and I was here, and it was dark, and I drove home, and my e-light was on, and I had to get gas, and if that literally is your memorial that you literally have built a shrine around when there's some stuff to be done every day, that's childish. If you do things with half an effort because you know someone else more committed is going to come along and finish your mess, that's childish. You see, we grew up in Jersey. We used to get robbed so regularly that it was normal to come home and see our back door shredded with an ax. It was normal. My brother and I were walking sometimes. We could hear someone in the closet one day, meaning we came in while the robber was still in the house. My mom was working all the way in New York. We run out the house. I mean, that was my life growing up, all right? So we couldn't afford an alarm system, so we got a Rottweiler. Only problem is the Rottweiler was from a rescue because we couldn't afford getting a Rottweiler with paperwork going all the way back to Germany. So we got a rescue Rottweiler. And I thought the dog had been struck by lightning once, honestly. So what ISIS would do is <laughs> ISIS always took massive number twos in the living room. And when you came home and it was just there all the time. So what my brother and I would do is we would... We'd clean it just a, just a little bit because we knew that mom was going to come home, suck her teeth, but then roll up her sleeves and do the scrubbing that you had to do. We were childish. When you serve in a way that's half committed, because you know there's people at the church that love Jesus and they will pick up your slack. And they're people that are committed, and you're leaning on their commitment and their fire, and they're the show must go on for the glory of God, so that you can kind of play your right foot in, your right foot out, and, and hokey pokey, that's childish. Are y'all still with me? You want to hear more of this, or should I just stop? Should, we just, should I tell everyone that we're, we're, we're having rev, it's revival, and that, man, if Jesus were to walk through it right now, there's no areas of growth in our church? Another thing about children is they're overconfident, childish, overconfident, overconfident, don't like to ask for help. You ever see the kid trying to carry something 18 times bigger than him? I got it. I got it. And get mad if you, mad if you try to stop them from literally being run over by what they're trying to carry. Overconfident and unwatchful. Why do we worry about our kids? Think of parents. I mean, y'all, that's why we got, got the gray hairs coming in. What do you worry about during the day? I hope my kid just looks both ways before crossing the street. You know, I hope they don't talk with food in their mouth. I hope they don't, you know, try to put a, a, a pea or a grape in their nose. I mean, it's just like the things that cross your mind, you know, because unwatchful. Let's go to Revelation 3 now because Jesus now is going to give an x-ray to a church in the ancient city of Sardis, and he's going to challenge them on their childishness that has them in a place where even though they have a great reputation, he's going to tell them that spiritually in their eyes, they're, they're a dying church. Let's go to Revelation chapter 3, and if you want to write down in your notes for Revelation 3, 
overconfidence and failure to watch. You see, when I'm childish, it has consequences spiritually. When I'm childish and I'm overconfident and I don't want to watch anymore, it's going to have consequences. And the Lord, listen to this, he loves us so much. He's given us Revelation 3, the letter to the church of Sardis, so that we can actually see what childishness can do in an individual life, what childishness can do with a whole congregation. And it's funny because when a child is unwatchful, they don't think they're being unwatchful. It's like, yo, you just walked out into the middle of, of the highway. It's like, yeah, but, but what? <laughs> it's, what do you mean just what? You, you, you can't do that, you know? When we're unwatchful, it's actually interesting and scary. We don't think we're not being watchful. We actually think that, you know, like what's the big deal, right? Jesus is going to give this letter. So look, how many books are there in the New Testament? 27, right? 39 in the old, 27 in the new, right? How many letters are there? Letters to churches are there in the New Testament. Come on, y'all. 21. Seven's the number of completion. No wonder then that there's three sets of sevens uh, in letters to the churches. But let me remind you of something. There's actually 28. Because in the book of Revelation, Jesus has seven letters to seven churches in modern day Turkey, which was Asia Minor. So let's remember that when you're talking about letters to churches, letters for correction, for rebuke, for encouragement, for edification, there's the 21 written mostly by Paul, but don't forget the seven in Revelation. And if you ever just want to take a good x-ray of yourself, read all seven letters as Jesus is giving seven report cards to seven churches, seven x-rays to seven churches. And this is what he says, Revelation 3. He says, to the angel of the church in Sardis, write this. And this was a church in the ancient city of Sardis. These things says he that has the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. What he's saying is, I have all authority Seven spirits doesn't mean that there's seven Holy Spirits. It's talking about the sevenfold ministry of the Holy Spirit. I have all power and I have the seven stars. Revelation 120 tells us the stars represent the churches. I have all power and all authority. He's saying here, this is for coming from the one who has all power and all authority. Hey, is Jesus still allowed to have that in our lives? Are you still excited, you know, that, wow, for him to let that wash over you, that he has all power and all authority, right? In a day where we could so easily make Christianity into this craftmatic adjustable cross and we could kind of adjust it, you know, like a tempurpedic to how we want it to be. Can Jesus still come in and say, I have all power and all authority? Yes. And he says this, I know your works and that you have a name that you live, but you're dead. Be watchful, strengthen the things that remain, the things that are ready to die, for I have not found your works perfect before God. The sobering thing, the scary thing is he's telling this church, I know your works. Do you know it's the same word in Matthew 5, 16? Let your good works shine before men so they could glorify your father. Do you know it's the same word for works found in Matthew 11, verse 2, when it talks about the works of Jesus? He's not writing a letter to a church that wasn't doing anything. He's writing a letter to a church that was very busy. He says, I know your works. The Greek word is where we get our word energy. I know your energy. This is not a church that would have had, you know, no need for a bulletin. They had stuff going on. I know your works. <clears throat> and I know your name. Name, write in your notes, reputation. You have, you're working, you're busy, and you have a good reputation for being alive. But he says, but you are dead. He's speaking to a church that what childishness looked like for this church was an overconfidence, right? And a failure to watch a failure to guard hearts and watch hearts that led to a church that was not relying on the Holy Spirit of God at all. It was human energy. It was everyone running on burnout. It literally was a childish church with a strong reputation. 
That's what it was. It was a childish church with a strong reputation. Do you realize I can have the best reputation among men, but actually be childish and actually be spiritually off and have the greatest reputation? Like your name is synonymous. Your name rings bells with, with fire for the Lord and literally not be walking in God's power, not be walking in God's spirit, and literally be absolutely childish, overconfident, unwatchful. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain. Would you underline the things that remain? What it means is there was still hope for this church. He's saying, yo, you're dead, but strengthen what remains. There's still stuff. There's still hope. Would you just write in your margin, just write hope. It was not hopeless for this church. Strengthen the things that are ready to die, for I've not found your works perfect before God. Just like we talked about a mark of childishness is doing things half an effort or doing things half to completion. How much is there that we can do in the church to do in ministry? And, and, and we always just kind of stop at the third quarter. Can people rely on you? It says love endures, love keeps going. How much that you've started and just don't finish, that you got into and just don't do? He's saying here, I've not found your works perfect before God. What he's saying is you started a lot of stuff and you haven't finished a lot of stuff. That's what he's saying. I've not found your works perfect before God. You start out with a lot of ideas, a lot of projects, a lot of what you said you would do, but yo, you, you stopped. And we talked about, right, what do the kids do? What did I do well, with my dog when I was a kid? I just left it off because I knew that someone else would come and pick it up. Like Paul said, yo, when I was a child, I understood as a child, I thought as a child, I spoke as a child, but when I became a man, I put away childish things. This here is a letter that's here to show us what we will become when we don't fight the good fight in daily putting away childish things. You know, another mark of a child and being childish is everything is always someone else's fault. <laughs> I mean, right? If you, if you want to go to a kid, why are you crying? Well, because mommy spanked me because this. It's, it's, the list begins of everyone else. But what did you do? Then, you know, get quiet, change the subject, right? This is here. This literally is here and held before us to show what will happen in our lives personally when we leave childishness unchecked, overconfidence, failure to watch. But what I love about a physician, and we're going to end here, what I love about a physician is a physician doesn't just tell you what's wrong. A physician tells you how to get back on track. Look at verse 3. He says, I'm, now I'm going to tell you how to get out of it. How many here literally want to just get rescued from childishness and especially this kind of childishness? I mean, wow, to think of the thought of standing before the Lord. And man, you could be getting this at every turn here on earth. And then to stand before the Lord and the Lord says, it was all dead works. You had a great reputation but anything. What did he say? It is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profits nothing. To get before the Lord and actually learn there that it was all flesh, all you, your way on your terms and your timing, according to your comfort level, according to your schedule. Here's a solution, verse 3. Remember Remember, he's asking you to remember. He's asking you to go down memory lane and look at this. Remember how you received and heard and hold fast and repent. He's saying, here's how you get out of it. Remember how you used to hear the word of God. That's what he's saying. Remember that what we all need to do, play the tape back when you received the word of God and you were going for nothing less than getting rocked. The mission was for you to get rocked. Look at what it's become today. It's become today, well, how long is the preacher going to preach? And oh, well, he went 10 minutes long. He went 15 minutes long. Uh, you know, my pastor's long-winded. You're focusing on everything that Jesus is in at that point. Congratulations. Because Jesus is here saying, remember, go back, remember how you used to hear. Think of when you were on fire for the Lord. Think of when there was nothing you were willing to part with for the Lord. No price you weren't willing to pay. You were willing to get in any car and go anywhere to show anyone the love of Jesus. 
And I guarantee when you go back to that, you'll remember there was a way the word of God used to rock you. There was a way that you used to receive it, that you used to listen and hear it, and there was a way you used to hold on to it. Today, we can end up just holding on to it the way we have a China collection. You can just kind of hold on to theology and polish it and just have it and look at my books and look at what I have and look at what I know. And you literally could do everything except for what you're supposed to do with the word. Let it enter into you and flip you upside down. Remember, remember. Would you do this now? Would you just remember how you used to hear? Would you just remember Would you just remember how you used to take it in? Would you just remember how you used to hold fast to it? And then he says this, once you remember, hold that up against where you are now and repent. Look at the difference and repent about that difference. And he's telling you exactly how to do it. And he says, look at this, if you will not watch, I will come on you as a thief and you will not know what hour I will come upon you. He could either be speaking here of a judgment on that church or he could be speaking of the rapture of the church either way coming as a thief but he's saying you literally want to change but remember he says in revelation 3 also i'm only telling you this because i love you isn't that what love does and then he says this you have a few names verse 4 in sardis which have not defiled their garments they will walk with me because they are worthy underline walk with me you know Our first time we see it mentioned in the Bible that someone walked with God was Enoch. Mm -hmm. Enoch walked with God. And you say to yourself, wow, what did that look like? I want that. He's saying here, there are some there. I know those there that are really on fire for me. Isn't it amazing that the Lord doesn't look at us as just, you know, a a group. It's all a wash. It's all off. No, I, there are a few there who are really doing it and they're walking with me. He always has his remnant. I think today we need to really apply ourselves to be a part of that remnant because I'm just going to tell you all this. The day we're in is slipperier, more slippery than it's ever been. Jesus told us that. They said, Jesus, what will be the signs of your return? The first thing he said is take heed. Don't let anyone deceive you. Deception will be at an all-time high. This is a tricky day to be in. The only place where we're safe is the word of God. The only place where we're safe is actually asking, well, what does the Bible teach on that? We need to be applying ourselves to the word. We need to be looking at where, where in us is just any ounce of know-it-allness. You know, I've been pastoring now at this point for 23 years. Do you know, I've seen a lot of ministry. You could just tell with the stories, right? But you know something, what I'm just still trying to focus on as I fight my own good fight of faith, Lord, just show me any area of me where I've become a know-it-all and let me always remain a student. No matter how skilled I am in anything I do, may I always remain a student. Do you still consider yourself a student? Because one thing about students is students ask a lot of questions. Are you at a place where you just have too much pride to be seen up at the church at the end of service with your Bible out asking your pastor a question? Because then it might give off the impression that you really don't know everything. Paul said, when I was, became a man, I put away childish things. Let's get back to the word of God And I love verse 5, he that overcomes will be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot his name out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. What that's saying is eternal security. You can be spiritually dead, but guess what? If you are Jesus's, your name will not be blotted out of the book of life. Isn't that amazing? That's important to share, because someone could sit there, oh my man, maybe I lost my salvation. No, if you're his... You are an overcomer and your name will never be blotted out of the book of life that will be held up against judgment day. But what he's saying is, I want you to be useful. I want you to be salt. I want you to be light. So now let's do this. As we're going to now move on next week back into Jesus and the night of the arrest and all what have you and the most amazing teachings on the Holy Spirit. What in you is just childish that today you're just like this has to go? What is it? Where are you resting on that reputation? But before the Lord, there's no concern of of how it looks. You really, as long as your reputation is good, you're good with that. How many of you are just resting in your church rep? 
People in the church know you, respect you. You're known as really getting it in. Do you really get it in as much as people think? Do you really sacrifice as much as people think? Are you really putting yourself last and putting others first the way other people think? Or have you really mastered how to show up and play this little role and then slip back into a selfish life? How good have you become at it? Let's get real. How skilled have you become at playing the charade game? And Jesus is saying, everything is open and naked before me. And what he's doing is he's saying, I, my love is going to cut through every childish part of you because I have promised to make you look like me. I'm the potter, you're the clay. I have promised, I have vowed. And when he could swear by nothing greater, it says in the word, he swear by himself. I've sworn by myself to never drop you. I've sworn by myself to never reject you. I've sworn on my own name to never discard you. I've sworn by my own name to give you new mercies and love every morning. I've sworn on my own name to conform you into my image and likeness. And love cuts right through what is damaging a person. Our childishness, it damages, we lose. It's not like, wow, I got in church and I got out and I didn't have to do nothing like, oh, you know, you know, free cheese. No, the one being damaged is the one who thinks they just got away with something. It's only damaging you. So let's fall back in love. Look, it's a, it's a, it's a dark day. Let's love one another. When I come to church, who can I hug? Who can I serve? Can I wash your car? Anybody want you want your car? Why? I mean, it's like, how can I imitate my Jesus in loving on someone? Let's get excited all over again about it. If you do something and you're serving here with someone and you did something and someone might even be grieved, ask them, hey, did that bother you? Hey, if we're having practice and I do this and do that, did that bother you? Is everyone good? Are we good? Because if you're not good, I'm not good. Let's all get back to literally, we're not a, we're not a business. We're a body. Amen? Amen? So I want to end by saying this, and the worship team can come up. Antioch has always been celebrated throughout the city as one of the most loving churches. And I praise God for that because that's a reflection of all of us really doing our part. However... The minute we think we got that, that love thing mastered, that's the minute we become an unloving church. That's the minute the Phariseeism, the professionalism, the churchianity, we have to continue to fight for this kind of love. Amen? Amen. So let's be excited. Would you be excited about Jesus' love for you all over again? And 